As I arrived at the next scenic spot in my rental car, the phone rang with a call from my mother-in-law, as if she had been watching the whole time. It was my mother-in-law. I gave my husband David a knowing look and answered, hello, Mrs. Johnson, what's up? Her voice was frantic on the other end. Get away from David right now. Grab your bag with your clothes and head to the bus stop by the cliffs. Mrs. Johnson, what are you talking about? I asked confused, David's planning to attack you. He's got a gun hidden in the car. So that was the game she was playing. I can't believe David would do that. Okay, I'll leave right away. My response might have sounded a bit flat, but it seemed to have convinced her. She hung up immediately. My name is Emily Johnson, a 29-year-old office worker. I got married to David last year, but because of the COVID pandemic, we had only registered our marriage. Now that the pandemic's effects have waned, we've been able to travel. So we're planning our belated honeymoon. My company was understanding and gave us time off for our honeymoon, even though it's been a while since we got married. We chose a national park, eager to take lots of pictures. I'm into landscape photography, while David's hobby is video editing. We've even discussed starting a YouTube channel for landscape videos. We've been living a quiet but happy newlywed life. However, there's been one concern, David's mom, Mrs. Johnson. She has always been overly fond of David, her son. Since David and I decided to get married, she seemed to have it out for me at every turn. Her subtle harassments during our meetings are a frequent occurrence. And the worst part is that she does it behind David's back. Did you make this stew, Emily? It's an unusual recipe for around here, but it's tasty. Can you share the recipe with me? I'd like to make it at home. Did you like it? I'm glad. I'll write down the recipe for you right away. It's good, Emily, but maybe you should also learn some traditional recipes from around here. It'll earn you more praises. That's how it usually goes. She's not praising my unique stew. She's suggesting I stick to the local recipes and not stand out. In fact, after the relatives left and it was just me and Mrs. Johnson doing the dishes, it was a barrage of sarcasm. Always wanting to stand out, making such a salty stew. Planning on giving our family high blood pressure or something? Scary woman, I tasted it, did you find it too salty? I asked trying to defend myself. I'll go lighter on the salt next time. I don't even want to eat your salty stew anymore, make something more traditional next time. But then, when David comes around, her demeanor completely changes. Emily, Aunt Susan said thanks for the stew recipe. Everyone really seemed to love your dish. Really? That's great. What would you like to eat tomorrow, David? Emily and I will prepare it together. With a beaming smile, she would interrupt our conversation, shifting the topic. It's so blatant that it's hard to even get angry about. It's become a bit of a joke for us afterward. The hilarious part is that David has already caught on to her two-faced behavior and subtle jabs. Mrs. Johnson thinks her son doesn't notice and takes every chance to berate me when he's not around. However, my husband David has already caught on and even secretly records or films her when it gets too bad. David has always resented his mother's overbearing love, which is really just excessive interference. Apparently, it has even crushed his dreams for the future. So when we got married, it was David, not me, who refused to live with her. Despite the happy occasion, it seems like Mrs. Johnson thinks I was the one who manipulated him. Her excessive love for her son blinds her to everything around her. I worry she'll do something foolish one of these days. On another note, we finally decided on the details for our belated honeymoon. Taking our hobbies into consideration, we decided on a trip to scenic locations within the country. I'm excitedly preparing cameras and other equipment. David is also getting a smartphone without a SIM card to take videos. We've packed a travel bag with clothing and toiletries. We'll be able to see canyons and waterfalls on this trip. I want to take beautiful pictures, so we need to check the weather forecast too. You're right. Landscapes shrouded in mist and clouds are mysterious and beautiful, but I really hope it's sunny. We laughed together as we continued our preparations. But even at a time like this, Mrs. Johnson interferes. Ah, a phone call. It's Mrs. Johnson as expected. Hello? I answered the phone in front of David and quickly switched it to speakerphone. Hello, Emily? 
Are you really planning on traveling with David? You've been married for over a year, and now you're going on a honeymoon. What are you thinking? It seems she wants to stop me from traveling with my husband. The best response to this is to flaunt the trip. Of course, we finally don't have any restrictions. David's company and mine have approved the leave for our honeymoon, and we're going to enjoy ourselves to the fullest. Mrs. Johnson fell for my bait. What do you mean, enjoy yourselves? It's probably just a cheap in and a miserable trip. I feel sorry for David. Mrs. Johnson's words caused David to frown in silence. This trip was something David had arranged himself without relying on a travel agency. I looked at David's face and changed my tone. Oh no, it's not a cheap in at all. David arranged everything. We're staying at a super luxury hotel with an amazing view. Of course, the food is five star too. And yet it's all at a very affordable price. I purposely spoke sweetly to provoke Mrs. Johnson. I'm always being picked on, and this time she was disparaging the trip that David prepared. I wouldn't feel satisfied without getting back at her a little. A super luxury hotel? Why are you going with David? Let me go on that trip. David would want to show his filial piety to me. It seems she couldn't keep quiet after hearing about the super luxury hotel. Now she's saying she wants to go on the trip herself. No mother would butt in on a honeymoon like this. It's not gonna happen. Taking over your son and daughter-in-law's long-awaited honeymoon is just uncouth. We'll be sure to buy you a souvenir. Goodbye. Imagining Mrs. Johnson's frustrated face, I hung up the phone. I laughed spitefully, and David was holding his head in front of me after I hung up. Emily, I'm sorry about my mom. I can't believe she tried to take over our honeymoon. Well, she loves her son so much, she probably just wanted to say something. It's not something to worry about. I smiled at David, but I also felt a twinge of anxiety. I had beaten her at her own game with all the resentment I had built up, but I might have failed. What if the angry Mrs. Johnson became obsessed with our honeymoon and started harassing us? This worry of mine would later prove to be true. From then until the departure of the trip, there was silence from Mrs. Johnson, not even a phone call. I had expected her to complain to David about me, but that didn't happen either. Her silence was unnerving, but we went on our honeymoon as planned. David's choice of scenic locations went off without a hitch, and I was completely satisfied. The super luxury hotel I had boasted about to Mrs. Johnson was top notch in every way, the view, the amenities, the food, everything. We even had the hotel staff take a picture of us enjoying dinner as a couple. Oh, I'm so full. David, thank you so much for arranging all this. After dinner, I collapsed on the bed in the hotel room. The bed was so soft and comfy too. Watching me happily roll around in bed, my husband David exclaimed with joy, I'm glad you like it. Once you've rested your stomach, how about we go to the spa? In the meantime, I'll check the videos and photos we took today. The spa, how wonderful. David, who had been opening his laptop while admiring me enjoying the plush bed, suddenly raised his voice after a while. What? What's going on here? Feeling an unusual sense in David's voice, I got out of bed and peered into his computer. We had rented a car to get around today. At every scenic spot we visited, we had parked the rental car and taken videos and photos, and the rental car could be seen in the background here and there. In itself, that wasn't a problem, but there were a few instances where a suspicious person who appeared to be a small-framed woman was lurking around the rental car. We couldn't see the face of the suspicious person, but we felt she was a petite woman. The suspicious person was occasionally opening the car door. Oh, here, we didn't lock the car because we were only there for a short time, David muttered, pointing at the screen. I recognized the hat the suspicious person was wearing. Hey, this hat, doesn't Mrs. Johnson have one like this? Yes, Mrs. Johnson has a similar hat. David's face turned pale at my words. That's right, this is my mother's hat. David and I stared intently at the computer screen. The suspicious person who looked like Mrs. Johnson was putting something black into the rental car. It looked like she was opening the travel bag that had been left in the rental car. Then, after a while, the suspicious person left without taking anything. Was something put into the travel bag? I hurriedly dumped it out. It felt strangely heavy. 
I hadn't noticed the difference in weight since the hotel bellman had carried it when we arrived at the hotel. It was a bag with clothing and toiletries, no valuables. Nothing seemed to be stolen. And then, something unbelievable rolled out from the bottom of the bag. David and I were stunned by what had come out. What's this? You're kidding. The next morning we left the hotel with exhausted faces. We had been run ragged, dealing with the incredible thing that had come out of the bag the previous day. When we arrived at the next scenic spot in the rental car, the phone rang with almost perfect timing. It was from Mrs. Johnson. I signaled to David, who was on the phone, to answer it. Hello, Mrs. Johnson? What's going on? Mrs. Johnson's voice on the other end of the phone sounded quite frantic. Get away from my son right now. Grab the bag with the change of clothes and head to the Cape's bus stop. Wait, how does she know there's a bus stop near the Cape where we're vacationing? How does she know the details of our luggage, like the bag with the change of clothes? Since she called at the perfect timing, she's probably hiding and watching somewhere. It was a call full of puzzling moments, but I deliberately asked Mrs. Johnson for a reason. Mrs. Johnson, what are you talking about? David is planning to attack you. He's hiding a gun in the car. I see, so that's the scenario. I already knew everything, but I pretended to go along with Mrs. Johnson's lead. That can't be David attacking me? Okay, I understand. I'll get away right now. Although my response was a bit wooden, I seem to have successfully fooled Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson hung up immediately. I signaled to David who was driving and headed for the bus stop with the travel bag. Of course, I didn't forget to pretend to be scared. And then I called the police. About five minutes later, I arrived at the Cape's bus stop, and a detective in an unmarked police car approached me. Well, it turned out just like you said yesterday. I never thought you'd actually call it in. The detective looked troubled. I'm truly sorry for involving you in this farce. I think David should have caught Mrs. Johnson by now, so please come with me. I headed back to the rental car, and the detective followed me in his unmarked car. From the parking lot where we parked the rental car, I could hear Mrs. Johnson's voice. Hey David, how did you know where I was? It seemed that Mrs. Johnson had never dreamed that her wicked scheme would be exposed in advance. She was caught by my husband, hiding in the shadows of a gazebo in the parking lot. Not today, I will not forgive you today. Mrs. Johnson was frightened by her husband's demon-like expression, but she was even more astonished when she saw me returning with the detective. In my hand was a travel bag, just as Mrs. Johnson had planned. Upon seeing it, Mrs. Johnson started to scream, Officer, arrest that woman right away. She's hiding a gun in that bag. She's trying to kill my son with it. Mrs. Johnson shouted and smirked at me, a triumphant look on her face. I silently stood before Mrs. Johnson and dumped the contents of the bag. Out of respect for the men's eyes, the underwear was placed in a small bag so that it could not be seen. However, the object Mrs. Johnson was after was nowhere to be found. What? Why isn't the gun there? I put it there yesterday, it should be there. Is this the gun you are looking for? The detective showed Mrs. Johnson a photo. It was a picture of a hunting rifle placed in a plastic bag. Upon seeing the photograph the detective presented, Mrs. Johnson's face turned pale. That hunting rifle, it belonged to my late father-in-law, didn't it? Honestly, how did you manage to open the gun safe? I thought my heart would stop when I found it yesterday. I called the police right away and handed it over. At mine and my husband's voices, Mrs. Johnson ground her teeth and looked down. Oh, since it was in Emily's bag, it's Emily's fault. I have nothing to do with it. Mrs. Johnson started yelling in desperation. My husband and I sighed deeply. But then, the detective approached Mrs. Johnson with a big smile on his face. Yeah, because it was in Emily's bag, we had to ask her about it. We spent hours questioning her yesterday, even though it was supposed to be a vacation. So, how did you know the hunting rifle was in Emily's bag? Although the detective's face was smiling, his voice was low. It's no wonder he's angry, after all. The hunting rifle was taken out illegally, even though it was unloaded. But I saw Emily put it in her bag. Mrs. Johnson, unable to look the detective in the face, desperately made excuses. Oh, so you saw Emily's travel preparations. But you and Emily's family are separated, aren't you? 
I chimed in with an obvious response. Of course we're separated, and we haven't let her into our house for a year. At that remark, Mrs. Johnson yelled back. Don't speak out of turn. The detective pressed Mrs. Johnson further. Oh my, were you spying on Emily's house? If so, that's a misdemeanor, and I'm going to have to ask you to come to the station with us. Upon hearing the detective's line, straight out of a police drama, Mrs. Johnson panicked. I wasn't spying. I put that gun in there, so you can't take me in voluntarily. Ah, she spilled the beans all by herself. Well, I had already mentioned it earlier when I turned the bag inside out. The detective, who had been smiling until now, became serious. Yes, a confession. You'll be coming with us voluntarily for violating the gun law. At the detective's words, Mrs. Johnson opened her mouth in shock. What? Why? I said I wasn't spying, didn't I? Mrs. Johnson's objection was met with her son's fury. It's only natural, Mom. You don't have a hunting license, and you took Dad's gun without permission. If the father-in-law who had a hunting license carried it legally for the prescribed purpose, there would be no problem. But you don't have a hunting license, so taking it out of the gun safe is out of bounds. It seemed that Mrs. Johnson knew nothing about gun laws or handling, even though the live ammunition was stored separately and not loaded. It's not loaded into the gun itself, it's a wonder she managed to bring it this far without an accident. Yet Mrs. Johnson still resisted. But when it was found at the hotel, it must have been in that woman's bag. That woman stole it from my house? It's not my fault. At the unsightly attitude of Mrs. Johnson, her son raised his voice. Yesterday, I caught the moment on video when mom put a gun in our rental car. Naturally, I showed it to the police. David's words made Mrs. Johnson's knees buckle. What? How did you find out? Frustration and tears welled up in her eyes. I explained in his stead. David was filming yesterday, and he caught the parking lot in the shot. We didn't notice it at the time, but when we were reviewing the video at the hotel, we saw it. Mrs. Johnson could no longer argue with my explanation. Now, Mrs. Kate Johnson, we'd like you to accompany us to the station on suspicion of violating gun control laws. The detective prompted Mrs. Johnson, who was in a state of shock, to get up. To Mrs. Johnson, David exclaimed, why would you do something like this? Just because you don't like Emily? I've had enough. I'm cutting ties with you, mom. At David's words, Mrs. Johnson suddenly began to scream and thrash about. Why? Why is that woman better than me? David, are you abandoning your mom? The detective forced the screaming Mrs. Johnson into the unmarked patrol car. You might not want to make too much of a fuss. When I called the house yesterday to check the gun serial number, your son's grandmother, an elderly woman, was furious. Eek! At the detective's words, Mrs. Johnson immediately calmed down. The grandmother in question is David's grandmother. Although elderly, she's still in good health, with no signs of dementia. She's practically the head of the Johnson household. Mrs. Johnson is in a state of complete submission to her. Even though she's the head of the household, she's not an unreasonable person towards others. Whenever I visit the in-laws, she's always so happy to see me, affectionately calling me Emily dear. She's a kind person. Though strict with Mrs. Johnson about household chores, she took care of her own room and private bathroom. It must have been quite something to make her so angry. As I muttered under my breath, the detective informed me. Apparently, since your father-in-law's death, your husband's grandmother has been keeping the hunting rifle as a keepsake. But the box with the keepsake in it was ransacked the other day. Upon learning that this led to the recent commotion, she was incredibly furious. The detective shivered. Shiver. I see, Mrs. Johnson must have ransacked her room to get the key. It's not hard to imagine her anger at having her son's keepsake disturbed. Afterwards, David spoke to the detective. I'm not going to pick up mom at the police station after this, David said. At his words, Mrs. Johnson's face changed to one of despair. The detective laughed and waved as he explained, yeah, David and Emily, you can continue your vacation. Your grandmother insists on it and her representative is on the way here. With that, the detective left with Mrs. Johnson. David heaved a big sigh. Emily, I'm really sorry. Our vacation turned into this. It's okay, it ended without incident. Let's just enjoy the trip, shall we? I said, and David looked relieved. 
Then he quietly told me I'm relieved that it's not grandma coming but her representative. When grandma gets really mad, she's terrifying. After that, we were able to enjoy our vacation, taking lots of lovely photos and videos and making good memories. Mrs. Johnson was not arrested but was sent to court for violating gun control laws. She was fined or imprisoned or both and is now anxiously awaiting the trial's outcome. After we returned from our trip, my husband's grandmother apologized for Mrs. Johnson's behavior. She blamed herself for leaving her son's keepsake hunting rifle locked in the house, leading to all this trouble, and apologized in tears. We decided to have the local police dispose of the hunting rifle. When handing over the rifle at the station, I asked to take a picture of it for her so she could at least keep a photograph as a memento. My husband's grandmother, who had cried and apologized to me and David, was ruthless with Mrs. Johnson. According to a relative who went to pick her up, she lectured Mrs. Johnson in a voice that echoed throughout the neighborhood for over 30 minutes. Oh, so your grandma really does get that angry. That's why mom always obeyed grandma completely. Now the whole neighborhood knows about mom's wrongdoing. Yes, thanks to her grandma's lecture, the incident became widely known and Mrs. Johnson could no longer walk the streets. After learning that David had severed ties with her, his grandmother obtained permission from the police station and prosecutor's office and sent Mrs. Johnson to a farm run by a relative. It was located in a basin-like area in the remote mountains of Nebraska. Even if she wanted to return here, it would take about three hours by car. Working herself to exhaustion on the farm, escaping would surely be impossible. After a while, it was dis discovered that I was pregnant. My husband, his grandmother, and the relatives were all thrilled. His grandmother was already caught up in great-grandchild fever and began to strengthen her legs. She seems to be planning to compete with my husband to take the baby for walks in the stroller. To make sure she doesn't drop the great-grandchild when holding it, she's also started working on her upper body strength. It's good to see her, who was quite downcast because of Mrs. Johnson's fuss, getting her spirits back. Today my husband and I are getting all the baby gear together. If it's with your grandma, I'd like to live together. She's really happy about it and it seems like she'll live a long time after the baby is born. Taking care of the baby with grandma, we're gonna manage somehow, huh? Well, if she's gonna live longer, I'll be happy too. And I'll talk to grandma about it. I picked up the camera. When the baby is born, I'm gonna take lots of pictures. Of the baby, my husband, his grandma, and family photos as well. With such thoughts, I was rubbing my belly. Huh? Charles is on a business trip too. I've heard Charles is out of town for work. I haven't heard anything about his trip getting shorter. The lights have been on every night though. The neighbor gave a puzzled look. Things got a bit awkward between the two of us, but the neighbor just went back to their house. I wonder what's going on. Charles was supposed to be on a business trip for a week, and it doesn't make sense for him to be home without letting me know. As I thought about it, I came up with a possible explanation. So I called Linda, my mother-in-law, and made a suggestion. Can you and your husband come over to our house secretly? Charles's birthday is coming up soon and I want to surprise him. Linda replied, of course, honey. A surprise sounds so thrilling. We'll head over shortly. Just hang tight for us. With that, she hung up. All right, things are about to get interesting. I grinned. My name is Jennifer and I'm turning 33 this year. Charles and I have been married for three years. We met at the company we used to work at. We don't have kids yet. I only switched jobs a year ago. I'm still getting the hang of my job and I'm worried about inconveniencing the company if I were to take maternity leave right away. So I wanna get more comfortable with my work first before thinking about having kids. I changed jobs to further develop my skills. Charles and I were in the same sales department, with him being my senior. I often sought advice from Charles whenever I couldn't meet my sales targets. He even accompanied me on major client appointments. We grew closer as I consulted with him regularly, and soon we were dining out and hanging out together, building a close relationship. Building a close relationship. Then one day during one of our usual dinner outings, Charles suddenly proposed. I'm in love with you, Jennifer. I want you to marry me, he said. 
having trusted him through our work together, I replied I'd be happy to. The joy on Charles's face when I accepted was unforgettable. He thanked me repeatedly saying, thank you, I'm going to make you the happiest woman alive. Seeing Charles so elated, I felt sure of the happiness that lay ahead. We lived not too far from Charles's parents who reside in the next town over. It's a comfortable distance for me, better than living with them at least. At the beginning of our marriage, they weren't too thrilled about my job because they believed that my dedication to work might delay us starting a family. Jennifer, don't you want kids soon? Maybe you don't have to work that hard, you know? Every time I met her, my mother-in-law would repeat this like it was her catchphrase. My father-in-law, perhaps eager child, would always tell me, I want to hold my grandchild. Charles is my only child, so you're our only hope, Jennifer. My father-in-law had just retired from a regular office job, and my mother-in-law was a stay-at-home mom. Charles was an only child, making them a family of three. Perhaps because Charles is their only child, it seems they expect me to have several children. I think they might also want an heir. Charles wants a lot of kids, right? I've overheard my father-in-law asking Charles this question numerous times, and my mother-in-law would say things like, I'll be there to help raise the kids with Jennifer. You can rely on us anytime. Charles probably got used to his parents' comments. He would only respond with, thanks. Well, kids are a blessing and we can't tell when they'll come to us. He never really defended me. So there were times I honestly didn't want to visit my in-laws, but they aren't bad people. I made some homemade roast beef for you. I remember you said you liked it. I hope you like it. My mother-in-law would often say bringing me some of her dishes. I admire my mother-in-law for being able to make homemade roast beef and I genuinely appreciate the delicious food. My father-in-law has his good sides too. Sometimes he would quietly hand me some pocket money saying, it's not much. I'm not sure if he does the same for Charles. It's nice that he would give it to me, his daughter-in-law. With such in-laws, I've managed to maintain a relationship of neither being too close nor too distant. However, the pressure for a grandchild from them isn't my only concern. My work has its own set of challenges, especially with business trips. The company I switched to requires a lot of business trips. At my previous job, they weren't too thrilled about my job because they believed that my dedication to work might delay us starting a family. Female employees had some considerations, so long trips were limited. But it's different now, perhaps because it's a sales job for construction materials. There are frequent trips. With all products developed in-house, clients are spread across the country, from New York to California. Regularly hopping from one place to another is the norm for proposal sales. Initially, I knew nothing about construction materials, so it was tough. Moreover, most of the business clients are men. At times, some would be dismissive, almost implying I can't discuss this with a woman. Being brushed off or not taken seriously was a regular occurrence. However, when a company accepts my proposal, the satisfaction is immense. And when I visit a completed building using our products, it's an inspiring experience that boosts my motivation. But as I became more accomplished in my job, the number of trips increased proportionally. Lately, I've been traveling once or twice a month, ranging from short two-day trips to ones lasting over a week. Some months I'm barely home due to business trips. It seems my in-laws are not happy with this. One day when visiting my in-laws with Charles, my mother-in-law sternly questioned, Jennifer, what do you think of Charles? Don't you want to stay home and cook for him? She must have been worried about her son, especially since she's been a stay-at-home mom her entire life. She probably assumed that it's only natural for a woman to prioritize the household. After that, I got an hour-long lecture from her. During this, my father-in-law just sat there looking extremely awkward like he'd become part of the furniture. Maybe Charles felt sorry for me getting grilled by his mom because he jumped in to defend me. Jennifer's been working hard, you know? I'm often away on business trips, so please don't be so hard on her. Charles gave me a reassuring pat on my shoulder. My mother-in-law seemed surprised, probably not expecting Charles to stick up for me. Maybe she thought she was conveying her son's feelings to me. Well, if Charles says so, she remarked, sounding resigned. Seeing her act like this made me think that she really must love and worry about her son deeply. 
That was an eventful day. I had spent most of that week on a business trip in Chicago. Initially, I had planned for a week, but my proposal to the client went smoother than anticipated, so I was able to come home two days earlier. I was thrilled about this unexpected change, but when I had informed Charles about my business trip schedule, he said, my trip's going to be the exact same time as yours. So don't worry, just do your best, Jennifer. So Charles shouldn't be home yet. Although I was glad to be back early, I felt a tad lonely thinking I'd be alone at home. However, as I approached the house, something felt off. To my surprise, I noticed the lights were on, particularly in our bedroom on the second floor. As I stood there dumbfounded, the neighbor called out to me, Jennifer, I'm so sorry about yesterday. The neighbor is a young woman in her early 20s, living with her husband and baby. Yesterday? What happened? I was caught off guard and must have looked puzzled. Neither Charles nor I were home yesterday, so there's no reason for her to apologize. Then the neighbor started explaining. For the past few days, my baby has been crying a lot during the night. You must have heard it, right? I was worried that we might have disturbed your sleep. She looked genuinely apologetic and concerned. However, I thought there must be some misunderstanding. Huh? Charles is on a trip. I had heard from Charles that he was away, and he hadn't mentioned anything about returning early. Really? The lights were on every night. I think they've been on every night, for the past week. Sometimes when my baby is crying at night, I carry him out to the balcony to soothe him. Our balcony faces your house directly. So I thought maybe you haven't been on business trips lately. The neighbor looked surprised. It, it created an awkward atmosphere between us. But then the neighbor was called by her child from inside her house and went straight back home. What's going on? I was increasingly puzzled. Charles was supposed to be on a business trip this week. It's impossible for him to be home without notifying me. The reason I think so is that Charles can't cook at all. Yeah. In the past, I would prepare a lot of meals in advance and freeze them. If I didn't get the food ready to just microwave, Charles wouldn't be able to eat. Suddenly, I wondered if he might have gone back to his parents' place. I decided to call Linda, my mother-in-law, to check. Hey Linda, has Charles been coming over for dinner all this week? I asked as soon as she picked up the phone. No, he hasn't been here, Linda replied with a surprised tone. That's strange. If he didn't go back home, what was he doing for dinner? As I thought about it, one reason came to mind, then I made a suggestion to Linda on the phone. Can you and your husband secretly come over? Charles's birthday is coming up soon and I want to surprise him. Linda replied, of course, honey, a surprise sounds so thrilling. We'll head over shortly, just hang tight for us. I knew she wouldn't hesitate to come. She's the kind of person who doesn't think twice about helping others. I tend to overthink things, but this time I was excited. I couldn't help but smile when I saw Jennifer. We had arrived at our destination. About 15 minutes later, my mother-in-law and father-in-law joined us. They clearly adored their son, Charles. I had mentioned a surprise for him earlier, and their expressions showed their excitement. My father-in-law playfully asked about the surprise. Charles thinks I'm still away on a business trip, so he must be feeling lonely. That's why I suggested we all sneak into the house and surprise him. I thought it would be nice to order Chinese dim sum, everyone's favorite, for dinner. I shared my plan with my in-laws, but I had a hidden agenda. They didn't seem to suspect anything. Sounds like fun. Let's order the premium dishes, my treat my father-in-law said with a smile. Should we also get some wine? Charles will be surprised, my mother-in-law added happily. Seeing their genuine joy made me feel guilty. I couldn't help but worry about what might happen next and how it could affect their happiness. But I pushed those thoughts aside and calmly said, shall we go then? From here on it's a surprise so please be quiet. I quietly unlocked the door and we entered. It was dark, but the light from outside made things somewhat visible. That's when I noticed something. As I had suspected, there were a pair of red high heels that didn't belong to me neatly placed side by side. My face went blank, but my in-laws didn't notice. They were still excited, probably imagining Charles' surprised face. We quietly made our way up the stairs to the bedroom on the second floor. Light was coming from the room, and I could sense someone inside. 
As we got closer, we could hear voices. I had a feeling of what was going on so I wasn't shocked. But, my in-laws seemed puzzled to hear voices coming from a room where Charles was supposed to be alone. They looked bewildered. Without saying a word, I went up the rest of the stairs and opened the bedroom door. As expected, Charles was inside. Jennifer, why are you here? He asked, looking surprised. I finished my business trip early and came home. What's going on here? I spoke to Charles. Next to Charles was a familiar looking woman. Well, Charles seemed at a loss for words. That figures. The woman with Charles was Linda, who worked at the same company as Charles as a receptionist. I used to work at the same company as Charles before I switched jobs, so I recognized Linda's face. She's younger than me and had just started right out of college. Her hair was brown and beautifully curled. Her nails and clothes were on point, showing she put effort into her appearance. However, even when I was at our old company, Linda had a reputation. And not in a good way. With her looks, it's no surprise Linda is a receptionist. She's very cute. She probably doesn't struggle to find boyfriends. But Linda has a bit of a manipulative side, but rumors had it that she frequently switched between men she was dating. A good friend of mine, who secretly dated someone from our company, lamented how Linda managed to snatch him away at some point. That time, I had to listen to my colleague vent until the last train, and all I could do was console her. After hearing such things multiple times, I couldn't help but see Linda as an enemy among women. As I was lost in those thoughts, Linda spoke. Isn't that Jennifer? What a coincidence, she said cheerily. She seemed utterly unaware of doing anything wrong. Linda, do you realize what you're doing? Charles is my husband. You know, I asked Linda trying to keep my cool. Though I was a tad irritated, I did my best to hide it. Linda chuckled and said, of course I knew. I originally worked at the same company with you and I tend to want things even more when they belong to someone else. Saying this, she teased me. Twirling her hair with her fingers, she looked at me with a mischievous grin. Indeed, Linda was just as wild as the rumors suggested. She didn't seem phased by the situation at all. In fact, she seemed to be enjoying the drama. I wonder if Charles couldn't stand this atmosphere. Charles hesitated and began to speak to me. Sorry, Jennifer. You've been traveling a lot lately. I've been kind of lonely and, you know, eating microwaved meals alone just isn't the same. Then Linda said she'd cook for me and take care of me, so just... When I glanced at Charles, his cheeks were slightly flushed. He must be gradually falling for Linda. I let out a heavy sigh and said, so that's the situation. What should we do, mother-in-law, father-in-law? Addressing my in-laws who were visibly shocked by the unexpected turn of events. My in-laws were standing near the stairs out of Charles and Linda's view. My father-in-law stood with his mouth wide open in shock. Why are mom and dad here? Charles hurriedly approached and was bewildered when he saw his parents near the stairs. You mean these are Charles's parents? Why are they suddenly here? Even Linda seemed taken aback. She probably hadn't expected not only me, but also his parents to be present. Did Jennifer plan a surprise for Charles? So why are you doing this? My mother-in-law was in tears over Charles's indiscretion. This was just too much for her. What the hell? You don't care about Jennifer and you're cheating on her? My father-in-law shouted at Charles, trembling with rage. My in-laws have always been close, and I've never seen them fight. This situation was probably unimaginable for them. While I was thinking about this, Charles started complaining to me. Jennifer, why did you call mom and dad? It's totally uncool to drag my parents into this, Charles glared at me. It seems that I am to blame for everything because I called his parents. Linda sided with Charles and said that's so low of you, Jennifer. My in-laws seemed quite irritated by Charles and Linda's remarks. After all, it's clear to anyone that the one cheating is in the wrong. My father-in-law was so angry his face was red. Aren't the worst ones Charles and Linda? Not just Charles. But it's totally unreasonable for him to cheat in the house I live in, too, I said looking straight into their eyes. I countered firmly, just because you were on a business trip, huh? It's my house, too, you know. I did nothing wrong. Charles replied defiantly, my house, you say? Do you even know who owns this house? In a smug manner, Charles responded, isn't it ours? 
it's clearly property shared between the two of us. I sigh deeply, no, it's in my name. Remember when you couldn't get approved for the mortgage because you had too many credit card debts? That's why it had to be in my name. Plus, you haven't paid your share of the mortgage. Ever since we moved in, I've been the one paying for everything. Neither of Charles's parents knew about this. They both looked quite shocked. They probably assumed Charles was taking care of the payments. Quick to defend himself, Charles said, all right, maybe you're right about the house, but I've been covering car maintenance and groceries, haven't I? You've had it easier financially because of that. I was taken aback by Charles's argument. He mentioned car maintenance, but he's the only one who uses the car. Today he used it. He used his car for commuting today, but I usually take the train. Most of the time, I travel for work using planes and trains, so I don't really feel the need for a car. The train station is within walking distance, so I have no issues getting around. So you are the only one using the car, right? And about the groceries, I usually do the shopping at the grocery store. Are you saying the groceries are for Linda? That has nothing to do with me, does it? Charles's face turned a shade redder, seemingly having hit a nerve. I was utterly disappointed and it seemed his parents felt the same. They were both at a loss for words. Anyway, a divorce between you and me is what's best, right? I'll be seeking monetary compensation for my mental suffering from both you and Linda. Also, since this house is mine, could you both leave right now? The mention of divorce changed the color of Charles's face. Hearing about my mental suffering, Linda went pale. Jen, are you joking about the divorce and suing us? I wouldn't be able to make it on my own, Charles said going pale. Considering how Charles has been spending his money, his reaction was not surprising. You've hardly contributed to our household finances since we got married. I bet you spend it on having fun with Linda or on whatever you feel like. I pointed out, Charles fell silent. Linda seemed taken aback by Charles's behavior. Then my father-in-law, who had been silent until now, spoke up. Jennifer, we're truly sorry. We had no idea Charles had been causing you so much trouble. My father-in-law seemed genuinely remorseful. And then my mother-in-law addressed me. The reason I have been working so hard is because Charles wasn't contributing to the household. We truly don't know what to say. We're so sorry, my mother-in-law was on the verge of tears. Charles's negligence must have been a shock to them. Speaking to Charles's parents, I said, I've tried to make it work because I used to love Charles, and the, but after such a betrayal, I've come to dislike him. I'm sorry to both of you, but I'll be seeking a divorce. I conveyed this to my in-laws, who had taken care of me in so many ways. My father-in-law responded, of course. We'll make sure Charles takes responsibility for this. We truly apologize for everything. He sincerely apologized to me and had tears in his eyes. Although I told him he didn't need to apologize to me, he remained silent and looked apologetic for a while. Then my in-laws took Charles and Linda and left. I remained in the house feeling a mix of sadness and regret and cried. Later on, the divorce went through smoothly. Through the lawyer my father-in-law introduced me to, I demanded settlement from Charles and Linda. I was able to collect $10,000 from each of them. Being able to collect this amount was also thanks to my father-in-law. He apparently gave them both a long lecture when he took them home that day. You betrayed Jennifer with what you all did. You all better show some real sincerity, he said. But neither Charles nor Linda had the money. Both of them liked to splurge on themselves. So, for the time being, my father-in-law fronted the $10,000 for each of them, and it seems Charles and Linda will repay him later. I am nothing but grateful to my father-in-law. As for what happened to Charles and Linda afterward, it turns out that both of them left their jobs. Rumors about Charles and Linda had been circulating in the company for a while. And when my divorce with Charles was finalized, their relationship came to light. Given the circumstances, the company felt the need to take some action. Their solution? Transfer him to a remote branch. Charles was moved to a tiny branch office in a rural area with just a handful of employees. There was absolutely nothing fun around that branch. Apparently, he couldn't handle it, so he resisted and decided he was going to quit. Of course, his resignation was accepted right away. Linda, being a contract employee, was not offered a contract renewal. 
There had always been negative talk about her in the company, and this incident seemed to be the last straw. An old colleague who I was close with at my previous company filled me in on all of this. I thought to myself, they got what they deserved. It is what it is. Around the time Charles left his job, he called my cell phone multiple times. At first I ignored him, but he was so persistent that I finally picked up. What do you want now? When I answered, Charles said in a desperate voice, finally, please you gotta help me out. From what Charles shared, he had been job hunting since he left his previous job, but had not been able to secure a new position. He had been living with his parents so he was getting by. However, one day, his father-in-law told him to sell his car to repay a debt of $10,000. After selling the car and giving the $10,000 to his father-in-law, he was told you're no longer needed here. Go wherever you want and live your life. It seemed Charles had been essentially disowned. I tried asking Linda but she was in a similar situation with no money. The only person I could rely on was you. Can you please help me out? He pleaded. Why would I help someone who did what you did? Actually, I'm right outside your house now. Can you let me in? Perhaps because he was desperate, Charles wouldn't back down. So I calmly told him, someone else is living in that house now, you know? I've moved away and live somewhere completely different. In fact, I'd rented that house to someone else. The rent was covering the mortgage, so it's breaking even for now. Well, uh, Charles must have been really shocked as his voice trailed off towards the end. I don't think we'll ever see each other again, so... Goodbye. I told Charles that and hung up the phone without waiting for a response. Then I immediately blocked Charles's number. Three years have passed since then. I'm as busy as ever. However, one major thing has changed. That's having a child. Turns out I met someone new after that and got remarried, giving birth to a healthy baby boy. I love my husband, he's really sweet, but oh boy, my child is just adorable. Right now, I'm on parental leave, taking care of my child every day. Of course, I absolutely love the hustle and bustle of work. That's never gonna change. But the cuteness of my own child? That's unbeatable. Even though every day is super hectic, I'm looking forward to spending fun times with my family of three. So I get a fortune and you get an old house and a plain old farm, huh? Sneering my brother, who unexpectedly got a lot of money from our inheritance. Quite a way to repay their daughter who took care of them and even nursed them. You were not really loved. It was infuriating, but I didn't respond. Just you wait. What goes around comes around. Fueled by my anger towards my brother, I sweated and worked on our neglected field. My name is Helen, a 50-year-old housewife. It's been 25 years since I married my husband, and our kids have grown up and become independent. We thought we could live a leisurely and enjoyable life, just the two of us, but life never goes as planned. Just as our children became independent, we started taking care of my parents. My husband's parents passed away long ago, so the ones we are caring for are my parents. We used to be farmers full of energy and were always healthy. When it was time to harvest the vegetables, I often helped. Freshly picked vegetables were so delicious. The vivid and sweet vegetables. The reason I fondly remember them is that I can't savor that taste anymore. As they aged, my parents lost their strength and had to retire. I really wanted to keep going, said my father with a weak smile. I wish we could get Helen to eat those vegetables again, said the regretful mother. I wish Mike had taken over for us, the father said. My father looked sad. I have a brother two years older than me. He's always been a bit haphazard, impulsive, and always getting into things. He barely attended high school and eventually dropped out on his own claiming that it was too much of a hassle. He then left home, avoiding a steady job and instead opting for day labor. When he thought he was drifting, he would suddenly return home and demand money from our parents. Still, they couldn't refuse him because he was their son. Once our parents quit farming, he stopped coming home. There's no money in retirement, he said. He has no business with us. Even though he's my brother, it's hard to stomach his behavior. I wish I could forget his existence, but he's still family after all. From time to time, our parents would worry, wondering if he was doing all right. 
Since quitting farming, my parents aged rapidly. Even a small hobby farm might have made a difference. By the time they regretted their decision, they had aged significantly and both had become bedridden. I'm sorry, Helen. We're causing you trouble, aren't we? Apologizing to me, my father and mother looked sorry, but I said, because of you, I am who I am today. Let me return the favor. When I said that, my mother thanked me, tears in her eyes. Taking care of them was challenging, but my children were already independent and I had never worked outside the home. I had thought about getting a part-time job once the kids were independent, but we weren't financially strained, so that could wait. After discussing with my husband, I began staying at my parents' home to take care of them. The end may not be too far away. The shock of hearing that from the doctor was substantial. I called my brother Mike, tears streaming down my face. Won't you come see mom and dad? Even if he's a slacker, to my parents he was their beloved son. I assumed Mike would at least remember the love he had received from them. So I asked him to see them one last time. But his response was nothing short of horrifying. Ta? Why? I'm kind of busy here. Busy? Are you working? Do I look like I want to bother with that? Nah, I did some day labor yesterday. Figured I'd take it easy and have some fun today. Does that by any chance start with a G? Oh yeah, sure it does. And next comes an A, and after that, it doesn't happen to be M, right? Way to go, Helen. You're on to me. What on earth are you thinking? You prioritize gambling over seeing our parents. It's more important to me than life itself. You are the worst. Overcome with rage at my detestable brother's abhorrent behavior, I hung up the phone right then and there. After that, Mike never visited our parents' house and didn't come to see them. Every day, they grew weaker, and then suddenly our father passed away, and our mother followed the very next day. Until the end, they were a loving couple. Once the tears have all been shed, a busy time awaits. Preparing for both funerals simultaneously is mom's task. Of course, my husband helps, and our two boys do their parts to make it manageable. Ideally, Mike and I should have discussed it together, but he never showed up. Somehow I managed to get hold of him, but all I got was, ha, huh. their funeral? I'm busy, gonna pass. You'll handle it however you want. Then he hung up, as if it's just something you can handle however you please. Even at 52, my brother Mike remains incredibly irresponsible. I miss my anger at my brother. The tearful funeral came to a close. Then one day, not long after, Mike finally returned to our parents' house. Even though he didn't show up for the funeral, he has the nerve to come here now for something as simple as a discussion about the inheritance. Hey Helen, it's been a while. You've certainly become a middle-aged woman, hen, haven't you? Leave me alone, Mike. You're an old man too. I'm still single though, so compared to you, worn out from raising kids, I'm pretty spry. People might mistake me for your younger brother. I was appalled at his choice of words for our long-awaited reunion. For someone who relished his bachelorhood, Mike looked surprisingly old. Did you visit their grave? Do you really think that the dead care about that? That's not the point, Mike. I felt a wave of annoyance at my brother Mike's complete lack of grief over our parents' passing, but I knew it was pointless to argue every point with him. I decided the best course of action was to get this discussion over with as soon as possible and take my seat. Well then let's get down to business. My gaze fell upon the attorney. Indeed, our parents had prepared a detailed will. Under the watchful eye of the attorney, the will was unsealed. What did it say? What's my share, Mike? Please just calm down. As soon as the envelope was ripped open, Mike lunged forward. Before my astonishment at Mike's behavior, the attorney read out the contents of the will. The result, Mike inherited the cash. I inherited the family home and the farm our parents worked tirelessly on. Upon hearing this, Mike laughed out loud. Ha ha ha, are you serious? This is amazing. I can't stop laughing. The cash, that's this check, right? Whoa, $300,000, seriously? Wow, farming really pays, huh? The check had been entrusted to the attorney along with the will. It indeed contained a considerable sum. For Mike, who had never held a steady job and lived day to day, this was a fortune. Even I was a little surprised to see such an amount. Sure, they worked tirelessly, but farming was both their hobby and their passion. It seems they probably didn't have anything else they wanted to spend money on. And what about you, Helen? 
With a smirk on his face and laughter in his eyes, Mike peered into my face. Even though he heard what was in the will, his unpleasant character was still glaringly obvious. The house and the farm. Ha ha ha, are you serious? Mike doubled over with laughter. Just bear it, just bear it. I braced myself and tried to contain my anger. So I get a fortune and you get an old house and a plain old farm, huh? With a belly laugh, Mike said, what a way to repay their daughter who took care of them and even nursed them. You were not really loved. I was so furious. I thought I might burst a blood vessel, but I managed to keep my cool. Arguing here wouldn't make a difference. Indeed, the value of this house and field combined doesn't come close to the amount of money Mike is inheriting. Our parents wanted me to safeguard this house and field, essentially the family estate, so I need to be resilient. I know better than anyone that our parents loved me. Well, the eldest son is usually the favorite, right? Plus, I was such an adorable child. Can't blame mom and dad for their feelings. Mike finally stopped laughing, swinging the check in front of my eyes. Well, that settles it. I'll be taking this then. What a jerk, Mike. Whether you get an inheritance or not, I don't want to fight over it later. Yeah. The lawyer prepared the paperwork. Mike put his signature on it and left. The moment Mike was out of sight, I ran to the kitchen, got some salt, sprinkled it at the front door, and shouted, Don't ever come back! I will forget about him. We probably will never meet again. I managed to shift my mindset and decided that forgetting such a horrible person is the best thing to do. About a year after our parents passed away, between the inheritance matters and all the paperwork, time just flew by while I was cleaning up my family home that had now officially become mine. The house that was once filled with stuff is now completely empty. I have a house that my husband built for us, and this one, as Mike said, is too run down to live in. I guess the smart thing would be to just sell it. But it's sad to think of the family home being gone. That's what I was thinking as I sat in the empty house. Then out of the blue, I noticed an old hole in the yard, not many people use holes these days, but my father loved using it. As a child, I was kept away from it because it was dangerous. The metal part was completely rusted, and the handle was rotten. Gently, I touched the hole that was barely maintaining its original form. I could remember my father working joyfully in the field, sweating profusely. My mother was laughing next to him. Such nostalgic, distant and dear times. I closed my eyes, indulged in memories, quietly opened them and determinedly said, okay, farming? Yeah, kind of like a home garden. Just a hobby, why not? The field that I inherited might as well be put to some use. When I consulted my husband about it, he readily agreed. Are you sure? It's the field your pair parents left behind. Give it a shot. I have nothing but gratitude for my supportive husband. I started tending to the completely neglected field with the help of a farmer who was a friend of my father's, and I started experimenting with the vegetables my father used to grow, as well as some new varieties. It was more difficult work than I expected. Phew! Farming is tough. I had my own small home garden, but this was on a different level. Not just the vastness, but the difference between growing vegetables for one's own consumption and for selling was striking how difficult it is to do it properly. Just reviving the field and turning it into a productive farm was a challenging task. Reviving the thin soil was hard. Thinking about the vegetables suitable for the soil was hard. What about the season? Pests, wild birds are also enemies. Not only growing, but also planning measures to protect the crops was required. The work didn't go as smoothly as expected, and I made mistakes. I can't believe you're doing such a thing. I, a wealthy man, couldn't do it. The one who looked down on me and even bothered to call was Mike. He had found out somewhere that I had started farming and called me. His usual offensive language, I hung up on him immediately. Forget it. I'm gonna forget about that. Fueled by my anger towards Mike, I worked relentlessly in the field. Although it was secondhand, the farming equipment was expensive, but I considered it a necessary investment and spent my savings. You're using your savings, so I won't say anything, said my generous husband. Although I call it my savings, the money for my single days has long been spent. The savings I have now come from diligently storing away the allowance my husband gave me, so ultimately, it's still my husband's money. 
Even then, I tear up, thinking about my husband who encourages me without caring about this fact. I've fallen in love with him all over again. My sons also contribute and share their findings with me. The farmer friends of my father have also been incredibly kind. Except for my irritating brother, I've been truly blessed with my surroundings, which have allowed me to concentrate on farming. I initially started as a hobby, but once I began, I quickly became deeply involved and serious. I guess I really am my parents' daughter. Time passes as I ponder over these thoughts. And then I did it. At last, the first harvest from my field. Far from the juicy and sweet crops like my parents used to grow, the amount of harvest is just a trickle. However, it's the accomplishment that counts. I'm satisfied. Oh, you're doing pretty well for a first-timer, the kind old farmer who helped me along the way said. Although I'm quite old myself, hearing his praise reminded me of my father and touched my heart. Adjust the amount of fertilizer and water, he said. Ah, yes, he used that kind of fertilizer. There's still so much I don't know. Gathering all the information I can, I strive to bring my produce close to the taste of my parents' crop. As time goes by, my field becomes more and more impressive. What started as a small corner is now a fully tended field. There are days of trial and error, experimenting with different crops. Gradually, the quality of crops improves and then, wow, another bumper harvest this year. Thank you. Please continue to supply to us. Of course, my vegetables have now reached a point where they can be sold. I have even managed to secure regular customers. Even a TV station came to interview me about the journey of a housewife who started farming and became successful. Before I knew it, the vegetables I grow have become a popular product. However, I couldn't have come this far on my own. I received help from many people and, most importantly, the knowledge that my father passed on to me was the key to my success. But I still have a long way to go. I'm still far from achieving the same taste as my father's crops. I have to try even harder, I thought as I clenched my fist. I heard a voice that I thought I had forgotten. Just as I was about to head to the field, I heard a voice that I had pushed to the back of my memory and turned around. Mike, I wonder how many years it's been. I recognized him as my brother from his slight resemblance, but he had changed a lot. It's not just that he's aged. Mike, your hair is, well, yeah, it's shining, isn't it? Leave it alone. As I stare at his thinning hair, Mike catches my gaze and shouts back at me, scowling. But I'm not the least bit scared. If anything, I feel like laughing. But if I laughed, things would just get more complicated. So I hold it in with all my might. My cheeks are twitching from trying to hold back my laughter. What brings you here, Mike? It's been quite a while. I thought we wouldn't meet again. I thought Mike would never come back to our parents' home again. Mike points at the house, now standing proudly behind me. What the hell is that? He screams. What do you mean? It's the home where you were born and raised. I know that, but it should be more run down. Why is it so beautifully maintained? Well, because we fixed it up. Where did you get the money for that? I earned it, pal. His yelling is getting on my nerves. Even though I'm pushing 60, my hearing is still fine. You knew I started farming, right? I've been growing vegetables in the field I inherited and business is booming. What? After countless hardships, I finally got my business on track. And now Mike has shown up. And as expected, he started to make trouble. So that field was actually worth something, huh? What are you talking about? There's no way a newbie like you could have made so much money from farming. Of course, I had to work hard. Who knew that land could be so profitable? He's not even listening to me. It must be full of nutrients with incredible capabilities. You knew that and kept quiet about it. No, I don't know what you're talking about. I know if a property is found to have a significant value later, we can rediscuss the, the inheritance division. I object. I want to rediscuss the inheritance division and get the field. You're an idiot. That's right. I'm an idiot. Wait, I'm not an idiot. No, you're definitely an idiot. I don't know where he got this information, but showing off his half-baked knowledge like this is just idiotic. I sigh deeply and tell him the value of this field hasn't changed. You're lying. What would I gain from lying? If you're suspicious, why don't you ask a real estate agent to appraise it? You ask for it. You'll regret this. I won't. 
the price of land around here hasn't changed much over the years. Well, is that so? If you're suspicious, ask a real estate agent. Seeing my firm assertion, Mike's confidence seems to waver. His face is gradually clouding over. But you're actually making a profit, right? It's all thanks to that field, isn't it? Well, sure, having that land did inspire me to get into farming. And as a result, I'm doing well financially. See? I knew it. God, he's annoying. My brother's misunderstanding is starting to grate on me. Fine then, enough. Frustrated with the conversation, I found myself yelling. I'll let you use half of the field. Do as you wish, all right. My brother thrust his fist into the air as though he had achieved complete victory. But despite my outburst, I was fairly calm inside. Let him try, I thought. My brother, who never once helped with the farm, worked when our parents were alive. I was curious to see how he would handle farming. Help me. Wow, that was fast. It had only been a month since my brother started farming. I had divided the field in half and let him use the very same half, and yet, just one month in, and Mike was crying out for help. What? What do you expect me to help you with? I asked. I have no idea how to do this. He whined, that figures. His plot of land was utterly neglected, no preparation whatsoever, made for planting crops. What had he been doing for the past month? Don't you get it, Helen? This land is supposed to be a gold mine. I planted seeds, so why aren't they growing properly? Is he still talking about gold mines? Does he think it all ends with sowing the seeds? If it were that easy to get bountiful harvest, everyone would be doing it. You have a lot to learn, Mike. In a few years, you might see some profit, I advised. Who would give advice, I thought, pushing him away. Yet my brother Mike came crying to me with a half sob. I wish he would stop. He's getting snot all over me. Help me out, Helen. You're my little sister, aren't you? I don't want to think of a guy who wouldn't even come to our parents' deathbed as my brother. Don't just call me your sister when you need something. When I coldly pushed him away, Mike slumped right there. I'm up to my ears with my own farm. I've come this far with the, the help of many people. You should work hard too, Mike, and become someone worth helping. I told you before you have to stick it out for a few years. I don't have time for all that. I tried to encourage my unwilling brother, but Mike shouted out in serious desperation. I can't even wait a few months. My debt repayment deadline is just around the corner. Debt? Yeah, I'm in debt hell. What the? You inherited $300,000 in cash, didn't you? I spent it. What? I blew it all on gambling and now I'm broke. What? I didn't feel like working anymore and borrowed money, hoping for a big break. But that's all gone too. Then I heard that you were making good money farming. So I thought, hey, why not me? But why doesn't it pay off for me? Why? I don't know. It's ridiculous and there's no point in discussing it. Can you believe it? In just a few years, my brother had spent all the precious inheritance from our parents, and he thinks he can just easily make a fortune in farming. There's a limit to, to messing around. Listen, Helen, please help me out. I refuse, no matter how much my brother pleaded. Pleaded, I couldn't bring myself to want to help him anymore. Perhaps if he had shown some determination to fight it out on his own, I might have been inclined to lend a hand. But my brother was as ever dependent on others. He wouldn't try to do anything on his own, the same old, careless and thoughtless character. Please help me, Helen. The debt collectors are almost here. Leaving my yelling brother behind, I left the field. I don't know what happened to Mike after that. I have heard rumors that he's on the run from debt collectors, but I haven't heard anything else. Well, I guess it's not hard to guess what's happening. When Mike left, the field came back under my control. The farming I restarted on this vast land is going well. As I was working the fields and rubbing my shoulder, my husband, who was helping out on his day off, gave me a massage. Would it be okay if I helped you with the farming once I retire? My husband asked me that the other day. His words made me very happy. My sons also seem quite interested, so there's a chance they might take over the farming. The home and the fields that my father protected and my mother loved. I wonder if they are happy that these have been revived. Mom, Dad, I will continue to protect this field. We will continue to work hard aiming to grow delicious vegetables just like the ones my parents grew. So please, both of you watch over us. 
my parents grew, so please both of you watch over us. Diseases. And my husband, who simply turns a blind eye and never even bothers to admonish her. Every day, I lose a little more patience with the two of them. How long must I continue to live this way? Honestly, I've been at my breaking point. Fine, I'll do as you say. I'll leave this house. Please never contact me again. My name is Ruby, a 34-year-old remote worker. Two years ago, I married my husband Matthew, and now we live together with his mother. Matthew was raised in a single-parent household, apparently had a hard time growing up, and told me he had endured countless hardships. I want to make things easier for my mom. Matthew would often say during our courtship, and I fell for Matthew because of his gentle side. Being an only child myself, perhaps because I was the sole recipient of my parents' love, I had feelings of gratitude towards them. Towards them, I felt a sense of gratitude and wanted to repay them in some way. Perhaps that is why Matthew and I were able to sympathize with each other on that point. Afterward, as co-workers at the same company, we decided to get married after a few years of dating. We discussed various things for our future together, such as where we would live and saving money to buy a house. However, our workplaces were far from our parents' homes, and at the time we didn't even consider living together. The first time I met my mother-in-law was during our marriage proposal, and her impression was far from the kind, loving mother that Matthew always spoke of. To be honest, I felt like she was someone I should avoid at all costs. So you're Ruby, Matthew's fiance? You're not what I imagined. I'm disappointed. I thought you were a cute, petite woman with a lovely smile. That's what my mother-in-law blurted out, barely paying attention to our greetings. At five feet six inches, I may be a bit taller than the average woman and my appearance may be more stylish than pretty. Apparently, I wasn't what my mother-in-law had in mind. Still, I never imagined being critiqued on my appearance during our first meeting. Naturally, I couldn't respond with a joke, so I simply laughed it off and pretended it didn't bother me. With the cold atmosphere that followed, I hoped that Matthew would come to my rescue, but instead, he just listened to his mother's story and chuckled happily. Is it okay to marry this guy? That was the first question that crossed my mind. However, from what I had heard, my mother-in-law had never been sick and seemed to be in good health. Her hobbies included traveling and shopping, and she had many good friends in the area where she lived. She also seemed to be actively involved with her neighbors, so even if I had married Matthew, I believed she wouldn't frequently impose on our home. On the way back from our first meeting with her, I casually spoke to Matthew. Your mom is really lively, isn't she? She's never been sick. She must be very conscientious. It looks like she has lots of friends around the neighborhood, so I guess we don't have to worry about living together. Well, yeah, for now she seems fine, and I think she's okay. I have been thinking that at some point I'll have to take care of her, but that's a future concern. Taking his words to heart, I stopped talking about my mother-in-law any further. To be honest, it was probably more of a relief. Regardless of what kind of person my mother-in-law might be, as long as my relationship with Matthew is good, there's no problem. If the issue of living together comes up decades from now, I'll deal with it then. That's how I decided to think. Shortly after we got married, we had talked about having a grand wedding but due to our busy work schedules, we had to postpone it. If anything, Matthew was understanding and supportive. Matthew was looking forward to the wedding more than I was. He was saying things like, it's a once in a lifetime wedding, so I wanna invite everyone, coworkers, friends, relatives, and have a big celebration. I'm sure mom would be thrilled too. However, I wasn't as enthusiastic. I was actually grateful that work was keeping me busy. Around this time, I started to feel a growing distance between Matthew and me, as if our hearts were drifting apart. We had different roles at work, and somehow I ended up in a higher position than him, which I could tell he wasn't happy about. I heard a rumor that you were promoted to section manager. Is that true? Why didn't you turn it down? Are you planning to quit when we have a baby? Quit work? I've never even thought about that. We agreed that we would both continue working after marriage, didn't we? I understood that his jealousy towards me was the reason for his behavior, so I stayed silent, not wanting to hurt his pride. 
it was the only way to keep the peace. But our relationship became awkward after that and then Matthew said something completely incomprehensible. I've thought about it and I want you to stay home and take care of the household. So quit your job and make things easier for me to work. I had a feeling he might say something like that and unfortunately, I was right. According to a good colleague, Matthew was upset about my promotion and had been complaining a lot at work. He had been saying things like she doesn't do any housework, she just lazes around at home. I do all the cleaning, laundry, and even prepare all the meals. But that's not true at all. Matthew has always left all the cleaning and laundry to me. He hasn't even pressed a button on the washing machine. While I thought this to myself, I couldn't tell anyone. Before I knew it, I was being seen as a wife who had abandoned her household duties. Naturally, I wasn't happy about these rumors, so I confronted him directly. Can you stop spreading these weird rumors about me? That I don't do any housework? That's absolutely not true. I'm the one doing everything, right? I even prepare your lunches every day. I raised my voice, which was unusual for me, and he seemed surprised at first, but then he immediately retaliated. See? You never try to support me. That's why you can't handle anything. It's impossible to balance work and household chores, so just quit your job. I was too shocked to respond. What was going on in his head? I had more to say, but I decided to hold it in that day. But even after that, Matthew kept insisting that I should quit my job. If you say you won't quit your job, then we can get a divorce. I talked to mom and she said that I should quit my job and take care of the household perfectly too. Matthew, unsatisfied with just gossiping about me at work, had taken to blabbing to his mother about every little thing. It was ridiculous, yet despite it all, I stubbornly continued working. I couldn't bear the thought of our marital relationship falling apart. After a lot of thought, I finally decided to quit my job. However, in return, I made it clear that I wanted to work from home. He didn't object. Huh? Working from home? Isn't that what people do to earn chump change? Well, if you're satisfied with that, I'll allow it. But I've got some conditions too. My husband grinned ominously. I was on edge wondering what he would say next. What do you mean conditions? I'm quitting my job, isn't that enough? What more do you want from me? How did my husband Matthew become so obnoxious? I can't even pinpoint when his personality took such a terrible turn. He started to resemble his mother so much, it's become a hassle just to talk to him. Well, my mom is moving in with us next month. Her lease is up at the end of this month. So she'll be living with us. Hope you don't mind. What? Is he serious? This can't be happening. However, everything seemed to have been planned out so meticulously that there was hardly any time for me to say, wait a minute. The very next day, my mother-in-law called me and she was like, Ruby, I guess you've heard the news. I'll be moving out of my place at the end of this month. It's all quite sudden, but I'm counting on your support. She sounded so pleased with herself. Matthew too seemed thrilled as he overheard our conversation. In essence, his plan was to have me quit my job and take care of the two of them. I saw through his scheme right away. His mother said she would move in at the end of the month, but sure enough, she vacated her apartment within a week and moved into our house. She didn't lift a finger to help with the housework and instead complained constantly. She was like, you should clean the rooms thoroughly and your cooking is tasteless. Who taught you to cook? I'd like to meet your parents. My living hell began the day she moved in and two years later, it's still ongoing. Before I knew it, my relationship with Matthew had completely chilled. I was treated as nothing more than a housemaid taking care of the two of them. What I realized after living with her is that she is a big spender. She has a weakness for designer brands, and she buys something new every time a new collection is released. She has more shoes, clothes, wallets, and bags than I can count. I tried talking to Matthew about it, but he brushed me off and said, it's not a big deal. Mom has always been into fashion. As long as she's happy, what's the harm? By this time, Neither Matthew nor my mother-in-law were contributing a cent to our household expenses. Matthew was using the money he earned for himself and my mother-in-law. As soon as she received her pension, she would go shopping. I was fed up with the monotony of everyday life and even questioning why I was living here. 
Amidst all of this, my mother-in-law and Matthew proposed something outrageous. Hey, mom and I are thinking about going on a trip for a week starting next month. A vacation in Cancun, pretty cool, right? Right? We'll even get you a souvenir. I was taken aback by the sudden announcement. It turns out that day was my birthday. How could you forget my birthday and plan a vacation to Cancun? That's unthinkable. You're kidding, right? You do realize what day it is, don't you? When I said this, my mother-in-law walked over and said, Of course we do. You even marked it on the calendar, right? It's your birthday, isn't it? But, you know, such things don't really matter anymore. They laughed and smirked as they looked at me. Annoyed by their attitude, before I knew it, I was blurting out my frustrations. Enough is enough. A vacation when you don't even pay for the living expenses. I've been paying for everything these past two years. After all, you made me quit my job, isn't that strange? My face was bright red with anger, and I felt like I could barely control myself. But they didn't care. My mother-in-law said, how I spend my money is none of your business. If you have a problem with it, you can get out of here. There's no proof you've been earning money in the first place. That was her response. Even though they were living off the money they took from me and spending it as they pleased, they dared to say such things. And my husband, who ignored my mother-in-law's words and didn't even bother to intervene, said, You were the one being supported, weren't you? You might have had to use some of your savings recently, but don't get all high and mighty. I was fed up with these two people in front of me. How long do I have to live like this? Honestly, I'm at my wit's end. Fine. I'll do as you say. I'll leave this house. Please never contact me again, Matthew. This is the end for us. We're getting divorced. Perhaps they were waiting for me to leave all along. They were grinning as if they had succeeded in their plan. Then, to my astonishment, my mother-in-law said, Perfect. Actually, we called the locksmith today. We were thinking about changing the locks after getting rid of the nuisance. That's what she said. I don't know what kind of plan they had, but it seems they conspired to kick me out of this house today. Mom, that's incredible. I didn't expect Ruby to decide to leave at this moment. You know, she's unexpectedly tenacious. I thought we'd have a tougher time, but it's all good, isn't it? These two clueless individuals were seemingly expecting to live comfortably in this house once they kicked me out. As if it would go so smoothly. In less than an hour, the movers will arrive, so can you pack your stuff quickly? I'll dispose of the larger items as bulky waste, so please only take what you need. Oh sure. Okay. I don't mind you changing the locks, but you both might want to get ready in various ways too. I told them something ominous. Of course, they didn't seem to understand, and after that, I quickly left the house. After leaving, I had mountains of things to do. Honestly, I was so irritated that I was furious, but I was thinking of a way to calmly and carefully send these two to hell. Having made the rounds to various services, I decided to enjoy living in a hotel until I found a new place. I've hardly been able to afford luxuries before, so I decided to spend a few weeks in a luxury hotel suite. Feeling like a celebrity, I was excited about what was to come. And then a few weeks later, I finally got a call. From the two of them, their voices sounded completely desperate. Hello? Hey! Oh, it's me, Matthew. Oh, hey. What's up? Have you by any chance received a bunch of something? They sounded completely flustered, their voices shaking, and it seemed like my, my mother-in-law was right there with him. I could hear a voice in the background. So what do you want? Well, what do I want, you ask? You should know, right? We got a call from the lawyer about a divorce and also an eviction notice within a week. This is too much, no matter what. I never even said I wanted a divorce. This is just too selfish. Let's make up with each other. Matthew, about to cry, was asking for reconciliation. Even at this point. From my perspective, I was like, what's gotten into this guy? After all, they forcibly took over the house I had been living in, changed the locks, and drove me out, and I was the one who owned the house. And my mother-in-law was pretty flustered too, and she took over the phone to try to persuade me. Listen, Ruby, the divorce thing is a lie, right? Matthew and I, we didn't mean it like that. You understand, right? We just said it as a joke, but you're taking it seriously. Matthew is Matthew does, but my mother-in-law is apparently quite an oddball too. 
Well, I guess it's like the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, you know? Well, considering I was the one who got kicked out, there's no way I can make up with you. And all this time, you've been using my money, so don't mess around. Ha, huh, but isn't that money what Matthew earned? Whatever I used the money my son earned on, that's none of your business, right? Even after explaining it before, she still seems to be completely clueless. She must have been under the impression that the money I earned belonged to Matthew. I couldn't help but let out a deep sigh when Matthew asked me as if something just occurred to him. Hey, just how much are you earning? It's strange that you own that detached house and you've been living the same lifestyle even after quitting your job. I've never given you a cent, you know? It seems he finally realized it. And then this guy just said it out loud that he's not paid a single cent. Well, since we're going to be strangers anyway, I might as well tell him the truth. <sighs> It'd be good for him to realize that the one that got away was a big catch. My earnings? I didn't really want to tell you, but I'll let you know. I make about $20,000 a month on average. I even paid off the mortgage on the house over the past two years. Actually, I've been the one supporting you and your mother all this while. What, what? $20,000? You're lying. There's no doubt that both Matthew and my mother-in-law must be regretting this. After all, you can't live a luxurious life on Matthew's salary alone. You see now? We used to work at the same place, so I knew roughly how much you earned. A net income of $2,000 was really tough, right? I was amazed that you even suggested quitting my job and becoming a housewife. Quite the character, huh? No, it's not like that. I've been working hard, believing that I could become a department head like you someday. So, um, it seems Matthew is under the impression that he's a capable man. He's never managed to get a position higher than a regular employee, despite being older than me. And it's clear from the company's evaluation of him. It seems like a waste of time even to bother with him. Well, I have no intention of making up with you. But after all, your mother, who's notorious for her reckless spending, would inevitably come with you. I don't want to lose any more things. Just move out of the house as soon as possible. Please, Ruby, listen to me, please. I apologize for all the horrible things I've said up to now. So please, despite their insistence, I have no intention of forgiving them. They really are persistent. Even my mother-in-law was like, Ruby, you can ignore me, but could you please make up with Matthew? I'll leave right now. Please, I'm begging you. This is a once-in-a-lifetime request. Look, I apologize for everything. It seems my mother-in-law was apparently crying. Of course, I won't change my mind no matter what they say. So I told you it's impossible. Anyway, I'm busy, so I'll talk to you later. Irritated, I hung up the phone. Knowing how stubborn I can be, Matthew didn't push me further. And as I told him, he soon found a new place to move to. He canceled the vacation they had planned and quickly packed up and moved out of the house. His new home is a rundown apartment that's over 60 years old. It creaks so much that it feels like the roof might fly off and the walls might collapse if a hurricane comes. Well, considering he's been living it up on my dime all this time, I guess it's about time he starts living a life that's more in his league, right? Afterwards, Matthew reported his divorce to his company. I heard that he was pretty much the laughing stock among his bosses. The boss was like, you're such an idiot for not cherishing a competent wife when you had one. Right in front of everyone. It seems like he's been whining about me all this time, but in reality, no one believed his stories. I hear they even told him that he got what he deserved for driving me away, right in his face. Hearing that story, I must say, was pretty satisfying. Ever since then, I've bought myself a brand new condo and I've been enjoying my new life. With the freedom to spend my money and my time as I please, I'm planning to aim for even greater heights in my career. Why are you here? Don't interrupt this important ceremony, go home. Why is my husband marrying another woman? Why am I being yelled at to leave? Lo and behold, my husband is trying to have a ceremony with another woman. I barged into the venue. But finally, I lost my temper with my husband, who is determined to go through with the ceremony. Oh really, well then let's liven up the ceremony since it's a special occasion. I turned back to the door and called for the people who were waiting. My name is Rachel. 
I am a 32-year-old working housewife. I have been married to John for seven years, and though we have had plenty of fights, we have managed to make it through thanks to the presence of our child. But lately, things have been peaceful and the arguments have decreased. I suddenly realized why. That's right, the arguments have lessened simply because we have been spending less time together. I am going to be late again because of overtime, and then I will be gone. Then I'll be gone for three days on a business trip starting tomorrow. Again, you've been working hard recently. It's tough times, gotta make money while I can. Never know when I might lose my job, gotta keep at it. With that, my husband yawned and headed off to work. Is daddy gonna be gone again? My preschool aged daughter rubbing her eyes asked. That's right, daddy's busy. He's gonna be gone even on his days off. I can't help but think that it's a bit too much to be on a business trip, even on weekends. But the fact is, he's working hard for the family, so I can't complain. With the economy being down, it's not easy to find a company that meets your needs if you want to change jobs. I know that because I'm working too. Mom's off tomorrow, so let's have lunch and go to the zoo. Really? Day. My daughter's face lit up with a smile, and I smiled back. It's sad to think that he won't be able to witness her growing up because he's so busy. I thought I'd send my husband some pictures of our daughter while he's away. That night, my husband went to bed early, saying he was tired from working late. The next morning he left early and he was gone by the time I woke up. I thought about how tough his job must be as I prepared the packed lunch. My daughter was thrilled to go to the zoo and I got lots of great, great pictures of her smiling. So I sent them to my husband, but he was probably busy at work and didn't read them right away. It was already noon, but there was no reaction and I still hadn't heard anything by evening. I thought I might try calling him that night, but I forgot because of a phone call from a friend. After all, my friend's call was to announce her wedding, which was a very happy occasion. Is that so? Congratulations. I was invited to the ceremony, so I happily agreed to attend. My husband returned home from his business trip, and I immediately wanted to talk to him about it. But he responded dismissively, I'm tired. Can we talk about it later? It's understandable though, since he's been working late nights followed by the business trip. He's bound to be tired. I apologized, but my husband silently retreated to his room. For some time now we've been sleeping in separate bedrooms. I don't know what my husband is doing in his room. He might want some time alone, but isn't this a bit excessive? coming home late at night due to overtime, almost always away on business during days off. It's starting to seem suspicious. Should I inquire at his company? But I kept going back and forth about it, troubled, day after day. Then one day my husband was actually going to be home on his day off. Our daughter was thrilled. Daddy, play with me, she exclaimed, tugging at his arm. But he replied, sorry, sweetie, daddy's tired, and I'm still working, you know. You're just messing around with your phone, aren't you? I'm communicating with my work partner. Our daughter looked unhappy at his words. Well, who can blame her? My husband was lying on the couch, humming to himself while fiddling with his phone. Can he really be that cheerful while communicating with a work partner? My suspicions grew. This was now more than just a woman's intuition. I tried to sneak up behind my husband to look at his phone screen, but he cunningly held it at an angle where I couldn't see. That made it all the more suspicious. If there was nothing to hide, he could be more open. That strange way of lying down his neck must hurt, and who would hold a phone at such an angle? Suspicious, very suspicious. My doubts were turning into certainty. So I decided to test him. You know, a friend's wedding is coming up, and since it's a day off and you'll be off too, could you take care of our daughter? The wedding was far off, and I thought he could adjust his work schedule. Plus, it was supposed to be a day off from the company, but as expected my husband's reply was, what? Even on my days off, I have work. You know that, though there's no way I could be booked that far in advance. I always tell you at the last minute when I have to work on my day off, so it's clearly strange that I can't adjust my schedule now. What's more, my husband said, why are you trying to push our daughter onto me on my rare day off? You're a real she-devil, you know? Don't you think a father should be able to rest? Isn't it precisely because it's a rare day off 
that a father should spend time with his child? I hardly ever spend time with her during the week or on weekends. And if I'm unwilling to spend time with her even occasionally, you have to ask what kind of parent I am. Don't I find our daughter endearing? Both my daughter and I were saddened by my husband's cold attitude. And so it continued with my husband rarely at home. He worked overtime until late every night. The next day, he left early for work without seeing our daughter's face. Of course, the weekends were spent working as well. At this point, he can't even be called a husband or a father. He is more like an uncle who only comes to visit once in a while. No, perhaps even less than that. This may require a serious talk. In the end, I had my parents watch our daughter on my friend's wedding day. So I decided to ask them to keep her overnight the following day. Our daughter has stayed at my parents' house by herself before, so it should be fine. While she's away, I decided I'll sit down and have a serious talk with my husband after returning from my friend's wedding. Then came the day of my friend's wedding. The sky was clear and the weather was perfect. I'll be going now. My husband left early in the morning, dressed very casually. He said it was okay because he was working on his day off. But was it true? Well, everything will be clear when we talk tonight. With that thought, I got ready, dropped my daughter off at my parents and headed to the wedding venue. Oh, what a grand place for a wedding. The venue was large and magnificent, with several halls that could host multiple weddings simultaneously. At the main entrance, the names of the couples getting married today were written. There were four couples, in all. I noticed that one couple's last name was the same as mine. It's an unusual last name but not unheard of. I thought it was a coincidence and looked around. I still had some time before my friend's wedding, but I could see some familiar faces here and there. As I approached to say hello, my friend looked at me with a slightly surprised face. Hey, you're early. What's up? Rachel, listen about that groom over there. Th my friend's face went pale and she pointed with a trembling hand. Looking up, I saw the couple getting married in the church where my friend was about to have her ceremony. The couple was showered with flower petals by the crowd. But then I thought, huh? That face looks familiar. John, from a distance, I squinted and then exclaimed in shock at the man at the center of the celebration. He didn't seem to hear me over the cheering, but I could hear the voices blessing the two. Among them was a voice saying, John, make sure you make your wife happy. No doubt the groom was my husband, John. What on earth is going on? We've been married for seven years, haven't we? When did we get divorced? I didn't know. No, we didn't, did we? We didn't get divorced, did we? Did he file the divorce papers without telling me? Should I check for avoid divorce? Today's a holiday, should I wait until the holiday's over? No, no, I can't wait, can I? That's definitely Rachel's husband, right? I thought he looked familiar. Just, just let me calm down for a second. Deep breaths are essential, staying calm is vital. I won't be able to have a sensible conversation if I'm all worked up. Trying to keep cool while dealing with the fact that one half of the happy looking couple was my husband, I tried to calm down, but couldn't at all. Well, of course, my own husband is marrying someone else. I can't calm down at all. In my exasperation, I almost tore at my carefully styled hair. My friend patted my shoulder, and the warmth of her hand finally helped me to think clearly. Nodding back at my nodding friend, I pulled out my phone to call my husband and get some answers. I pulled out my cell phone. Once the ceremony was over, the reception would follow. The Grand Banquet Hall was also home to the reception area. Looking at the sign at the entrance, I quickly found my husband's reception hall. I stood in front of the door and took a deep breath. Glancing back, I laid my hand on the door. I opened the door with a bang. In the silence, all eyes were on me. The guests at the reception stared at me in astonishment. After a quick glance at the attendees' faces, I looked straight ahead. There, the couple was about to cut their cake. One of them, the groom, was looking at me with the most surprised face. Of course, he would be as the groom was my husband. My husband, John, seemed truly shocked. I silently approached him. Beautifully dressed, the bride and John were holding a knife ready to cut the cake. He was dumbfounded for a moment, but when I stood sternly in front of him, he finally seemed to snap to his senses and started panicking. What are you doing here? 
John asked in a fluster, dropping the knife. Oh my, so much for the first joint effort of the newlyweds, the bride commented, addressing the flustered John. John, do you know this woman? The beautiful young lady, who was probably younger than me, asked. John, clearly flustered, answered, yeah, I know her. I mean, I don't know her, or what on earth are you talking about? You're not making any sense. The bride's face showed her puzzlement at my husband's nonsensical statements. In his haste, John blurted out, actually, she's an old girlfriend I broke up with. An old girlfriend? The bride repeated surprised, yes, my girlfriend before I met you. We broke up over personality differences, but she doesn't seem to accept it. She keeps following me around. Is that so? The bride asked, her expression showing her disbelief at my husband's story. What the heck? I exclaimed, utterly astounded by my husband's ridiculous story. Poor girl, she believes him, I thought to myself, feeling sorry for the bride. But then John glared at me, his expression changing. Hey you, we broke up a long time ago. Do you're disrupting an important ceremony. I'm gonna sue you later. Just leave now. The moment he yelled at me like that, my thin string of patience snapped. I'm the one who's... I started to say, but John interrupted me. What? What's with the mumbling? Just leave already. I'm the one who's going to sue you, I retorted, not backing down. Well, John exclaimed, clearly not expecting me to snap back. He recoiled at my sudden counterattack, but I did not let up my attack. If you want to have the ceremony so badly, I'll let you have it. But without your relatives, it'll be lacking in excitement, I yelled, turning to look back at the entrance of the banquet hall. That's why I invited your relatives. What? Right after my words, John was stunned, and the door banged open again, revealing, What? Dad? Mom too? Yes, John's parents. And also, wow, my brother, my sister, and even my aunts and uncles? Yes, all the relatives. What? What? Why is everyone here? I invited them. Rachel. You. Why must I receive such a reproachful look? My husband, turning pale, tried to grab me, but his father was faster and stepped in front of him. John. You fool. Ouch. Wow, that punch from dad looks painful. With unsympathetic eyes, I watched my husband's head get smacked. That's right. As soon as I saw my husband having the ceremony, I called his parents. Naturally, they were shocked. They came right away with all the relatives. We dead. Just listen to me. I won't hear it. Sit down, I'm gonna lecture you. But this floor is hard. Just sit down. Yes, sir. His father's thundering voice was so authoritative. As he was scolded by his father, I smirked at him and spoke to the young woman standing beside me. She was still in shock, obviously the bride. I felt sorry for her, but had to explain. I spoke to her, nice to meet you, I'm John's wife. What, Weiss? The bride who had been staring at John in shock turned to look at me. Hmm, she's really cute. It's just the type that John likes. By the way, I have an ordinary face. In terms of the difference between ideal and reality, I am the reality, and the girl in front of me is the ideal. We've been married for seven years and have a child. Child? To the disbelieving bride, I showed her our wedding pictures. My in-laws had brought them for me. And then I showed her the pictures on my cell phone. A photo of John holding our daughter as a baby. I don't have any recent pictures since John is never around. The bride stared at the pictures, dumbfounded. She must have known nothing. So, how did you and my husband meet? I asked her, um, he was a regular at the coffee shop where I work. It seems she worked at a coffee shop. John often went there to drink coffee. He asked me out, she said. Ah, John asked her out. That was clear. He said the reason he was still single at his age was because he was destined to meet me. Yes, husband, I caught you in the act. I caught you in a big lie. He always came home after work and we always met on weekends. He often took me on trips. Oh my, the evidence is everywhere, isn't it? So you were lying about working late and went to her house? He was meeting her on the weekends? I want to sue my husband. Can I have that evidence? She readily agreed to my brazen request. All right, I've got the evidence. Now I can move forward with an advantage. Well, with all this evidence, I can surely get a divorce without any problems. My husband is continuously being nagged by my scary father-in-law. He's sobbing, but he has no right to cry. I bent down beside my sobbing husband and put my hand on his shoulder. 
With tears in his eyes he looked up at me, making a truly pitiful face. Rachel I'm sorry, I really wanted to have a wedding with her. She said if I don't marry her she'll leave. Aha, whatever. Just divorce me. I really didn't care, so I just nodded and said that to him. Then, my husband's eyes widened in shock. Wait, that's what surprises you? Divorce? No, I wasn't planning on going that far. What are you talking about having a ceremony like this? Do you think you have the right to refuse? You, your... I don't even want to call you by your name anymore. Since you've been cheating, I want the property settlement and also child support all paid in one lump sum. No, I don't want a divorce. What the heck are you talking about at a time like this? What's wrong with this guy? I can't forgive him as my husband or as a person. It's not just about me. You left our daughter alone and now you say you don't want a divorce. We don't need someone like you. Just marry someone else. No, it's not like that. Excuse me. I don't know what he's thinking, but my husband was crying and saying he didn't want a divorce. As I was coldly responding, I heard a small voice. Looking over, I saw the bride who was looking down and hiding her expression. It was her. Samantha, no, it's not like that. I truly love you. Rachel kept refusing to divorce and I couldn't get divorced easily. But I really wanted to marry you. Hold on, didn't you just say you didn't want to divorce me? He probably doesn't even know what he is saying. Basically, he is saying he doesn't want to divorce me, but he also wants to marry Samantha. Are you an idiot? Before I could say that, my father-in-law said, are you an idiot? And slapped his son, slapped his son on the head. Yeah, well done, father-in-law. Ah, that's enough. The one who said that, having seen it all, was Samantha. What? My husband asked, tears in his eyes. She turned her icy, cold eyes on him. I don't want to marry you. What? I'm calling off this wedding. Thankfully, we didn't get the marriage license yet. And besides, you're already married. Bigamy is illegal. No, wait, Samantha. I love you. What about your wife? Huh? Oh, Rachel? I don't love Rachel. When Samantha asked about me, my husband was about to say he didn't love me, but I glared at him and he changed to, ah, actually, I do love her. What's wrong with you, man? You idiot. It's not me this time. The one who yelled you idiot was Samantha. She finally snapped, I can't forgive you for proposing to me while you're married or for betraying your wife and child, and then saying you love both of us and want to marry but don't want to divorce. What do you think you are? I'm, I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. I'm gonna sue you. What? This is clearly fraud, isn't it? Marriage fraud. No way. Wait, Samantha, I... My husband was clinging to Samantha's dress. And what's more, he was reaching out to me with his left hand while grabbing the dress. Seeing this, I looked to the side. Samantha was looking at me, too. We exchanged glances, nodded simultaneously, and grabbed the husband's hand. Together, we pulled him up and shoved him away, shouting in unison, Are you an idiot? With a dumb cry, the husband crashed into the cake. After that, we apologized profusely to Samantha and those involved for ruining the ceremony. But they thanked us, saying they were glad to have been told. Nice people. When he was hesitant about marriage, I thought something was strange. But when I said if we can't get married, we should break up cleanly, he finally agreed. I wonder what he was planning to do after the wedding ceremony and registration, Samantha said. Really? I thought it was strange that he didn't want to invite relatives. He said he wasn't on good terms with them and didn't want to invite people from the company either, Samantha added. Yeah, it's weird that there were no guests from the husband's side. Samantha ended up getting a settlement, along with compensation for the husband's actions. It's been a good lesson in life. I want to find a decent person more carefully next time, Samantha said, smiling brightly, hinting at her strength. I'm sure she'll find a wonderful encounter next time. As for me, I had to apologize to a friend for not attending her wedding, but my friend sympathized with me and assured me that our friendship would last forever, which was a relief. Naturally, I divorced my husband. He was adamantly against it, but when I said he who chases two hairs catches neither, he gave in. I didn't understand why he was so against divorce, but I concluded it must have been because I had an income since my ex-husband's savings were all gone.
It seems it wasn't a good idea to think that he was taking care of the mortgage, given that I had a job with a decent income and never received living expenses from my ex-husband. My ex-husband had poured all his remaining salary into his girlfriend. Well, that's why he lied about being on frequent business trips and was actually going on vacations. Money can disappear in no time at all. Well, I'm not going to be lenient about the division of property and child support. I'm not allowing any installment payments. His parents ended up covering the money. Under the strict supervision of his stern parents, my ex-husband is now scrambling to repay them, working his original job and taking on a night shift as well. Rumors of his sleazy behavior have spread at work, and he's treated with disdain. Female co-workers even avoid getting close to him. Well, let him suffer, that's what he deserves. Life for my daughter and me hasn't changed much since the divorce. My ex-husband was rarely home, so it's only natural. Without a lazy father lounging around, my daughter seems livelier, don't you think? Watching her grow up healthy and cheerful, I can't help but laugh, thinking I must be careful that she doesn't end up with someone like her father in the future.